think about this sort of as you're in a great room in someone's house here. We're going to have a conversation. There's some food out there still. Just, you know, this is informal. Um, we'll joust a little bit, but, you know, just want yourselves uh, and the audience to feel comfortable. And, you know, this panel is here in service of you uh, to have a conversation. So, um, sort of a depressing film, uh, by and large. Uh, a little bit of a downer. Uh, but that's also, I think, part of the point, quite frankly. And, um, you know, because something like that, a piece of media gets deeply, deeply embedded into our, into our psyches. Panelists here uh, you know, do a brief introduction of themselves down the line. Um, and then I'll just throw out a topic and we'll be off. Um, so, Tim. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Butterworth. I'm the operations manager here at the BIC. Uh, I'm responsible for all of our equipment and we specialize in advanced manufacturing technology here. So I have a perspective on manufacturing that's different from this type of plant and hopefully looking more towards the future. My name is uh, Dennis Rubello. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the BIC, and I'm charged with institutionalizing learning, including the launch of the, uh, the BIC Manufacturing Academy, which was fueled with, um, uh, by our partnership with MIT. Uh, we're in week two, and I just finished teaching class, so it was wonderful to see a stream of students depart and uh, catch a glimpse of this event tonight. Uh, that's a little loud. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Eric Planey. Uh, I'm CEO of a construction and clean tech startup that is operating out of the BIC and hopefully soon in a, a small assembly facility in Pittsfield uh, called Solablock. I think I'm here for a little different context. And first off, I want to apologize to PJ because you're going to have a hell of a time trying to rein me in tonight on this uh, particular topic. Uh, I was born in Ohio. I was born in a town called Youngstown, Ohio, which lost 60,000 steel-related jobs between 1977 and 1985. My first job out of Bowling Green State University was working for Bank One Corporation in Dayton, Ohio, covering the auto industry. I happened to be in Dayton when the social contract between GM and Dayton was broken, when there was a massive brake plant strike in 1995 and 1997. That kind of led to some of the events that led to that GM plant closure. And I had the fortune, really blessed fortune, of working in China for Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi covering the global auto industry from 2005 to 2007. So I've got a lot to say. Half of it's going to be scattered, and so I'll buy you all drinks afterwards. It's a, sa it's a safe space, Eric. Okay. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Sure, you want to record this? <laughs> uh, my name is Mike Lindsay. I'm a Taconic graduate, 1979 vocational machine shop program. Cut my teeth in the local mold shops here uh, for many years. I uh, opened up a small business inside GE Plastics, Building 100, in the development center there, where I've been working for the last 23 years. Uh, I was hired 11 years ago by Sabic, you know, in a different uh, in, a, in a different capacity. Um, but some of the similarities I've seen in the, uh, the film here touched home and manufacturing, I believe, is an important part of, a, of a, the well-being of a town. It's an important part. I think we all know when GE lost, we lost 15,000 jobs here, what it did to, the, what it did to our economy and our, and our local economy. So you know, how do we bring that back? I, I think the COVID is kind of exposed some of that weakness with supply chain issues. Um, when you look at manufacturing today, I know PJ's has mentioned this a few times, that you know we're not in a dark, dirty kind of environment anymore. It's, things are cleaned up. If you look in the Albany area and look at what they're doing over there with, with chips, manufacturing chips and everything, I mean, these are the kind of things that I see that I would like to be, some, see, see if I can get someone back here in Pittsfield to do this kind of thing. So. Thank you, Mike. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, kick an initial idea out here. I'm going to throw it to you, Eric. Um, I want to start with the, this idea about the scar tissue. Um, just you know, culturally, generationally, um, there is a story about American manufacturing that we have been told um, that continues to be told through a, a film like this. Um, and that scar tissue, is, it, it cuts very deep. Um, and I'd like to hear you know, what, you, what you think about that idea. Yeah, you know, first off, I think, um, let's see if that catch, catches me. The one thing, I, I don't necessarily love this movie. And the one thing I did love about it was really empirically was the relationship between Rob and Wong because I've experienced that myself living in China and working with Chinese colleagues who I consider some of the best friends I've ever had. Um, the, what I didn't like about this is because they picked a particular factory at a particular period in both American history and Chinese history that I think created this juxtaposition, you know, this differing of opinion, differing of methodology that really makes for great drama and great cinema. But I think if I wanted to give a little bit of context, if you go 25 miles away from this facility in Springfield, Ohio, 
there are 15,000 employees of Honda, a Japanese company, working and working incredibly well. Those plants are so efficient that the high-end sports car, the Acura NSX, is made outside of Springfield. There was a real big, in my opinion, there was a real difference between the way that Japanese and Korean companies evolved post-World War II and post-Korean War into adopting best practices for manufacturing, internalizing those processes, and then exporting those processes. China was much different. In China, American companies moved there very quickly because of cheap labor. And we could talk about why Walmart was to blame for that, but that's another story. Um, but anyways, what happened was Chinese companies grew and grew very quickly because their biggest resource was cheap labor. Not skilled labor, not an effort to, skill, to create skilled labor, but an effort to just be cheap and fast. And so what happens is when they get the money and they get the fortunes and are winning American contracts, they then take export that not so great methodology to the United States and they try to do something like that. And I think it doesn't represent international investment and international manufacturing prowess effectively. So that made for great drama, but I don't think it really, really reflects, you know, the evolution of global investment and globalization of manufacturing. It's like if you made a, a film called American Music and it was just about rock and roll, you know? What about jazz? What about rhythm and blues? What about bluegrass, you know? Yeah, and like, I mean, uh, I don't know why this just thought about this, but when Led Zeppelin was given the Kennedy Center honors and the next day they're on David Letterman, they talked about how well, their influence was actually American blues artists who weren't getting any airtime in America and they went to the UK and, they, and the UK citizens uh, fell in love with them. So, I mean, talk about that global circle. But I think there's something very similar about international manufacturing that was done effectively, i.e. the Germans, the Japanese, and the, um, uh, the Koreans. I remember interviewing for my job at Bank One in Dayton and my, my major at Bowling Green was finance international business. And I, someone asked me, why do you love international business? And I said, because my dad and my uncle lost their jobs. And they said that the steel mills moved, moved to China and Mexico because the Germans and the Japanese did steel better. And so how could you not be interested in international business when your whole community is affected by it? Anybody else up here want to speak to Scar Tisher or anyone in the, uh, our esteemed audience here? Well, I, I think that what's important, I appreciate Eric's context building and history lesson. Um, my dad ran a steel company called American Steel and Aluminum Corporation, uh, and so we were a metal supplier, so we saw the ways in which metals, uh, various types of metals, were introduced into the supply chain, and also how it became an international affair and the demise of steel right, in, in the U.S. But rather than stay on that track, I'm interested in, in sort of highlighting the human skills that aren't necessarily deployed, not just in factories, but across all of the work we do as modern human beings, right? And that the relational exchanges that we have have a deep impact, right, to our part, right, in terms of our productivity. We fail sometimes to, to honor the complexity of being human today, and the bridges, both rhetorical spoken bridges as well as uh, the bridges that can be built by not speaking, right? By being contextually aware, by being empathetic, by listening and collecting information, then discerning and being more uh, capable of tuning our brains to that collection process and then discerning, right? As the ultimate, really, technology, if you will, uh, to then be able to take that information and, and then and say, okay, we need to evolve something that I just learned, right? I explored, I communicated, I discerned. And therefore, I bring that back and I have a, a conversation. And that conversation creates mastery through shared dialogue and systems thinking. And when we can start to do that across all types of companies, including factories, then we're starting to you know, collect the right kinds of positive inputs, if you will, into this machine we call work. And the outputs are much more uh, catalytic to you know, better community engagement and better just skills to have as a human being, right? Like, you know, the fact that I'm teaching a human skills class right now, it shouldn't surprise anyone, right? That, you know, I mean, like, we're so device dependent and, you know, well, Sherry Turk all over at MIT talks about the empathy muscle being unused through her books, uh, both uh, the reclamation of conversation and alone together, right? We've seen people who are alone together in their devices. So what happens to our capacity to pattern recognize? So when we work with uh, workers through the Manufacturing Academy here, Tuesdays are, you know, driven by framing tools and simulations and then eventually the application of framing tools into the company. More, more like, think of it as Tech Tuesdays, but with Thursdays is around, 
you know, those human skills that are catalytic to those actual technical skills and framing tools actually taking hold. And so we need to constantly fuel the development of both. And um, I, my contribution is sort of in that lane, right? How do we augment, if you will, to steal a, a phrase from a book that was uh, it's, right, augmented lean, how do we augment the way in which we uh, do lean Six Sigma or TQM, any type of sort of way to create more output by thinking about our human input in that process and involving frontline workers to share their insights in ways through the devices and technology so that they can they can be part of those collaborative conversations. A frontline worker should not be relegated to these sort of uh, prison camps of non-engagement. They should be invited to the table, right, and taught how to be, be in conversation to provide inputs to folks who are in R&D, in engineering, in supply chain. And when we start to do that, we're really leveraging um, all of the human assets at play within any setting, including this setting that we see that, of course, as PJ rightly points out, makes for great drama. So I'm just sort of scanning the audience here. Who, which members of the audience here, you know, just a quick raise of the hand, you know, work for uh, a company that is a firm that's considered a manufacturer? Or have. Or have. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to hear, you know, and if, you know, throw your hand up and we'll get, and we'll get you a mic, um, you know, how this film reflects or doesn't reflect what your experience was as a worker uh, or as a manager or as a CEO. Um, any takers? <laughs> All right. So let's come back to the, yeah. Well, let's, let's get a couple of mics up in the front here. We have. I, we I have, think uh, Roger's biting right the here. The lovely Denise Linda, yeah. oh, Mike yeah. running to the yeah. front here. I, I, uh, hello. <laughs> I, uh, I mirror a lot of what Eric's thoughts are. I hated the film. I'll be, I'll be up front. I hated it. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I won't go into the background as to why I think it presented a bad message, but um, I think it highlights, if you want to talk about culture, it highlights a huge cultural difference in the American workforce versus the, the Asian workforce. Let's call it an Asian workforce. The concept of independent thinking, the Asians will never have that. Never. It's a cultural thing. Um, the, m today, manufacturing labor is such a small content in manufacturing that cheap labor it no longer makes any difference. I don't, I'll pay. As a matter of fact, there was an interview with the, the gentleman that runs, um, the name escapes me, the company that builds the iPhones, but they, they, they built a plant in Minnesota. And he Foxconn. said, Foxconn, thank you. Mm -hmm. What's his name? Oh, I don't know. But anyway, he, he said, you know, uh, people pay $750 for a phone. I, you know, there's $75 worth of labor in it. I could pay $10 more for labor, and it won't make a difference in the cost of the phone. So cheap labor is no longer the issue. What they don't touch on is that the, the manufacturing business in China, they, you know, they, they eviscerate the environment, okay? There's, uh, you know, when, when I, in the products that I build in my business, we compete with the Chinese, and, and, the, and the Chinese products are junk. They're junk. People don't want Chinese products today. Um, so, and a lot of that is, is based on the cultural differences in the, in the manufacturing cultural differences. Um, you know, there's, there's, so many, there's so many issues here that, that, that uh, you know, that get my, the, the hair up on my back that they can pet in the direction that I go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, that was, that was something. I mean, you know, yeah. but... But we are our own worst enemy. Um, it, they, they picked a business that was a very transitional business. You know, uh, as Eric said, you know, down the road there's a company mm -hmm. with American manufacturing that's doing great. I'll show you 100 clean American factories building products that the Chinese only dream of building. And at some point they'll steal the technology to build it. But, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, don't lose faith in the American worker, union and non-union worker. But I want to say something really quick about that that donkey comment. I that one thing that really infuriated about that is that it makes an enemy out of the Chinese. Ninety nine point nine percent of the Chinese that I know would never say something like that, right? So again, it, that's why they put it in there because it is raising the hair on our skin when we hear comments like that, right? But we all there's one percent of bad actors, whether you're American, Japanese, you know, German, whatever, and unfortunately they put that guy there, and it creates that stereotype. And it creates more divisiveness, right? As opposed to actually creating a solution out in that movie and seeing where things will go, they put that in there. 
but you know, they, there is a huge push in American manufacturing today. They realize that long supply chains are their death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and shorter supply chains are the solution, and they're all gonna go back there. The question is, can we get there before we're in a conflict with China? Which will China's eventually in a different be different spot in their industrial cycle. Also, mm -hmm. say that again. China is in a different spot in their industrial cycle than we are now. What do you mean? They are going to get better. Hundred percent. They are going to get better. Who who remembers Hyundai's from the nineteen eighties? Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Jap How Jap long? Scrap. Yeah. I grew up with Jap Scrap. I mean, Japanese stuff was garbage. Mm -hmm. Today, it's the best stuff on the bonnet. Or day The Japanese day built products. Day they never yeah. built garbage. The Japanese built products that weren't attuned to the American market. The Japanese never built garbage. It just wasn't designed for the American marketplace, which are the, you know, let's face it, the, the, Asian, the Asian culture is not a consumption-based culture. So they can't make products that are attractive to the Asian markets or the Chinese or Japanese markets, because they won't mm -hmm. sell here. Mm -hmm. The reason the Japanese cars didn't sell originally or didn't sell well, it's not because they were junk but because they weren't built with the creature comforts that the American market wanted. Uh, I, I tend to disagree with that. Okay. I, you know, I, I, now, in, in the early days, I think their manufacturing just got better and better and better and surpassed us, and we got lazy. Using, a, by the way, an American, uh, uh, was it Demings, right? Using Demings tech, an American went to Japan, and he had an audience where he didn't have that same audience in America. The Deming, right? Eugene Demings, was yeah. it? Yeah. Deming. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, he did a good job. Yeah, th <laughs> this is great, and everyone's everyone's entitled to hate the film. It's not my film, so you know. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, I want to ask a question that's not a hating question. Um, <laughs> I know I uh, have had some exposure to the auto industry in Detroit and Michigan and Ohio. The one thing, I, I, my question is, we're not seeing the whole film. Was there any discussion of how when you shift from an auto manufacturing plant to a glass plant, what you're not getting, which you, have with a which you don't have with a glass plant that you have with an auto plant, is all the jobs created by the suppliers of all the components? Was that addressed or discussed no. in the film? And, well, it, and also the technical aspect of redoing the assembly line was not really discussed. They kind of blew through that. And I think that, I would love to see a documentary on that. How do you tear down an auto assembly plant and address it for a but, new But in terms product? of the, the community and the job creation and the revitalization of the community, glass, you're not revitalizing all the suppliers that were supplying the GM plant. That's my point. That yeah, that it, was not discussed, but that's not in the yeah, film. No. That's too bad. I, I want to point out it's not an old film. This won the Academy Award three years ago. And so part of, I mean, part of what I see and why I thought this was important is that the film is very problematic. You know, it's, it's really sort of, it, it's, it's embedding us back in some of the old ideas. And when you call something American factory and it wins the Academy Award, it has an impact on people's cultural and psychological perspective on American manufacturing. Right. When you match that with the scar tissue people already have, and they see that old story told again, it's just reinforcing these narratives um, that are not productive. Um, and so com coming back to that $108 billion, new construction uh, you know, factories in the United States, you know, I, I want to believe that it's not this story. Well, you just have to visit any one of the members of the, you know, the BIC. I said jump to that. Right, and, and you can see that these manufacturing companies today, right here, as you say, li they li you know, we, innovation lives right here in the Berkshires. They're absolutely the cleanest places you've ever, yeah. I mean, they're cleaner than homes that have multiple housekeepers. I mean, they're like clean rooms. When I used to go to the Cleveland Clinic to advise leaders and, and coach them uh, with regularity, I mean, cleaner than hospital clean rooms, you know, and it, I mean, this is remarkable that we have this. So I think the movie is problematic because, you know, and obviously dramatic for a reason, right? Because it does highlight, though, some, some of the shadow sides of being an American, being soft, being unadaptive, being not, not to say, Roger, that we're all that way, right? But it, I will say that, you know, those are traits that we get tagged with right, many times, and sometimes accurately, right, sometimes accurately. I mean, if you look back 200 years ago, what was, what was our tolerance for discomfort, right? It was, it, was, it was pretty high. We could get really uncomfortable. 
But today we have folks complaining about the heated seats in their cars and how they're not operating as quickly and how the latte that they just got was wrong. And they didn't exert any effort or work. So, you know, there's, there's this, you know, IG over DG, right, instant gratification over, de you know, delayed gratification issue that, you know, goes back to the Stanford Marshmallow test. But it, 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 it's still very much alive here today. And I think that the film is, I don't like the film, but I like the conversation that it can spark, that we should still pay attention and discern um, what it could be telling us that might be helpful, right? And I think it's very unfair that, to Eric's point that this was a transition company at a transition time and it's a very narrow slice and it, it's unfortunate, but let's learn from it, right? Let's reframe this poor film uh, in a way, even if it did receive some accolades and, and pull from it in a way that can help uh, advance, advance manufacturing in the way in which we work together today. And that, that to me is the takeaway, right? Like how do we address as parents, as teachers, as leaders or influencers in our community how people think and explore work. And I think, you know, this, you could take um, probably any one of the promotional videos from a, from a Berkshire regional manufacturing company and just obliterate this concept that's being perpetuated, this narrative that American factories run this way and American people act this way. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, oh, hear from Tim here, our, our, our 3D printing guru. Uh, I think one of the things that the film mentioned briefly but didn't really go into, uh, I think Tom was the, the gentleman with the horse farm, said that he learned everything about glass from uh, Leon and Juan. Uh, they didn't import 200 Chinese workers because the wages were lower. They imported 200 people with very specific knowledge on a manufacturing process. That's what they brought over to Ohio. And there are things that Americans can build that nobody else can. The ball in your, um, in, your, in your pen, that's such a tiny little cheap component that's a fraction of a penny in every bic that you buy, but it's such high precision that if there's any run out at all, it'll jam up and you can't write. Nobody else except for American companies can manufacture those ball bearings to that precision. On the flip side, uh, TSMC in, in Taiwan, the um, global foundry, uh, the process that goes into producing custom silicon for computer chips is unbelievably intense. There's thousands of different factors that go into that process control. And the domain knowledge needed to run one of those successfully is just massive. So we have the Chips Act. We have huge investments in Albany and uh, elsewhere within the country. Uh, but that knowledge, like we are a decade behind on that because we haven't been running those foundries. So I think what we need to think about in addition to Automation, seeing those robots come in, the nature of the jobs as they shift from uh, you know, low skill to medium skill to high skill, it all comes down to the knowledge that is, that is shared, that is withheld, that is siloed, that's collaborated, that's built upon. Uh, and I think that's really the important um, piece in globalization. And to speak to the complexity of globalization, you know, here at the BIC, we have... Uh, uh, our Big Rep Pro printer was made in Germany. Our Polyjet from Stratasys is Israeli technology. We have mm -hmm. Prusas from the Czech Republic. Uh, we have uh, filaments that were uh, produced with Sabic chemicals. And then we have some that were built here in Massachusetts. We actually have three different 3D printer company brands, uh, Formlabs, Desktop Metals, and Markforged, that are produced within the Commonwealth. And that's, you know, Massachusetts is certainly a leader in additive. And we try to stay local as much as we possibly can but not a single one of those machines doesn't use components sourced from somewhere else in the world. So we can't avoid globalization. We have to lean into it and try to use it to our advantage. Um, and I think from the workforce, like we don't bemoan uh, the lack of, of elevator drivers anymore. You know, some jobs are, are just destined to disappear. What we need to do as a society is be nimble in retraining. We need to make sure that there are opportunities for people to move from one type of work to another. You know, Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, his dad went from making toothpaste to repairing the toothpaste making machine. We need to be ready to make all of those decisions or all of those transitions on a one-to-one -one basis for every job that we, that we automate out of existence. I, uh, to jump on Tim's point, I used to uh, play this little mind game with people when talking about one of my former clients. I used to uh, bank Trek bicycles in Asia. 
And Trek's an incredible story because they're based out of Wisconsin, right? And, you know, in 15, 20 years ago, they moved one of their, they opened a factory in China. So fast forward five years, seven years later, 70% of the bicycles they make are made in China. And everyone goes, oh, it's too bad. But they make more bicycles than ever in Wisconsin because Trek has grown so much. But the bicycles they make in Wisconsin are the ones that Tour de France riders ride, the 2,000, 3,000 precision machines. The ones they make in China are the ones, if you look at the welds, not so great. You know, they sell for two, three hundred dollars at, you know, whatever, Target, Walmart, whatever. Right. So to Tim's point, quality of manufacturing has not left the United States. And we 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 sometimes harp on how factories move so quickly overseas. And we can talk about that. But the quality was always there and has stayed there. And that is going to be the foundation for this incredible amount of investment that is now coming back to these shores because of the Inflation Reduction Act, because of the Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, and because companies woke up to the supply chain conundrum post-COVID. So it's a great thing. We have the foundation to grow, and places like the BIC are going to help us get to that next level using tomorrow's technology. You know, I, go, go ahead, Mike. Go. And I think the build on that, and, and to Tim's point, is that we start to bring in the younger people. I think we got to start hitting them in the high school area. Mm -hmm. We need a feeder program, and I think that's kind of that's where I came from, and I think that was really important, and I think that's what we need to start building also. 100%. Yeah, I mean, this is about hearts and minds, you know, and, you know, if someone's going to consider a vocational education in high school, I mean, you need to get to them when they're little or get and get to their parents, you know, and, and really, um, you know, I, I think... I hope vocational education is going to is making a real comeback, uh, and I think those you know those fancy degrees that cost two hundred and fifty thousand dollars I think are in leaving people in lots of debt are proving to not be as valuable as perhaps they once were. Um, I want to introduce an idea which is this relationship between uh, coming back to the one hundred and eight billion the the relationship between American innovation and American manufacturing. I don't think you can necessarily separate innovation from manufacturing. Um, you know, in order to create something, you have to make something, you have to get feedback, you have to, you know, be, there, there needs to be a proximity to those processes um, in order to really iterate quickly and to innovate. Um, you know, I, I worked, I produced a documentary that was so much better than this, it was called Project Frontline, um, it was with Boyd Biomedical, uh, and it was about the manufacturing response that was mobilized here in Massachusetts in response to, to COVID. And a lot of the, 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 the flexibility that we had here in the Commonwealth was due to that proximity of having an existing manufacturing base and having all these innovative you know, learning, you know, teaching hospitals and life science companies, medical device companies, and then, you know, when we were facing a common foe, um, that collaboration really helped accelerate a response to the crisis. But without the manufacturing piece, it wouldn't have been so effective. And so a lot of what we, you know, theorize in the film is that there is a value to the proximity of manufacturing and innovation. You don't just innovate and then export your product to be mass produced somewhere. Well, I think Eric's Eric's company is an example of a company that's creating a, a hyper-localized supply chain. Can you speak to that? A Which bit? one? Mine? Yeah. Oh, Solobuck? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, Come on, I'm trying to plug you here, man. Oh, uh, don't. Well, we'll take care of that. And by the way, you were mentioning lattes. I want to say the Bix coffee is fantastic tonight. Um, <laughs> morning report? Is that the morning report? No, what's oh. interesting is, so Solobuck is hoping to open our final assembly facility, um, and we make a solar panel that's embedded into a cement block. So whole side building walls can have you know, that are dormant assets are actually creating, you know, solar uh, clean energy generation. But what was great about Pittsfield, because the, the, the founding team is really, they're, they're out of Springfield, but we identified Pittsfield almost immediately as the place we want to be. Why? Because all of our supply chain is within 30 minutes of the city of Pittsfield. And what's great is we're trying to sell ourselves as both a Massachusetts and New York uh, company. You know, that border between New York and Mass is not a real wall. It is invisible, and people have to recognize that, and states have the hardest time doing that. 60% um, of the material that goes to our Tier 1 suppliers comes from New York State. So that's that symbiotic relationship that is so essential that can really elevate the Berkshire. So uh, I fell in love with this area when I came here and I took this job a year and a half ago because it has so many similarities to what I saw happen in Ohio uh, as part of Youngstown's comeback over the last 10 years. And I see Pittsfield going through that same type of dynamism right now. It's incredible. But our laminator is nearby. Our uh, injection molder is nearby. Our wiring company is nearby. Our block manufacturer is in Chicopee, so in Springfield. And then we have all the other service companies from banking, IT, support, human resources, all here. So that hyper-local supply chain is happening, and I think that's going to be clustering more and more to help bring back manufacturing to the not just Pittsfield, but the whole United States. Yes, sir, you, uh, you in the back. And please let us know who you are. <laughs> uh, I'm Zach McCain. I'm 
a longtime resident of Dalton. I'm a structural engineer by trade, but I took something a little bit different away from the FEM and that it, it seemed like they treated all the workers the same and like they were almost robots and they wanted them to act like robots. And mm -hmm. what I've experienced uh, in manufacturing in the past is if you find the job that somebody's really good at, they're gonna be happier doing that job and they're gonna be better doing that job. And uh, we had guys and women working for us that you find what they really like to do and let them do that and mm -hmm. they'll be better at it and faster at it, so. Thank you. You know, that makes me think of uh, Eric's earlier point about GM breaking the social contract uh, with auto manufacturers. And I think collectively as a, so a society, we've broken the social contract with manufacturing in general. Yes. And there's been this big push that you have to go to college for decades now. That's the only path forward if you want to have control of your, your own destiny. Uh -huh. You must go get a degree. Uh, and manufacturing has, you know, we've seen real wages drop in face of inflation. We've seen working conditions get worse and worse. And yet here we are saying that we want people to get back into manufacturing. And why would somebody coming out of high school trust that? And that's a, a question that I'd pitch to all of you. Why would a, a senior in high school really believe that they should go into manufacturing instead of pursuing a college degree when most of what this country has done for the past few decades has really proven that that's the wrong decision for individuals. Well, I think that that's, that's, that's a great question. I would also say that we, you know, we really have to help our high schools. Uh, there are high schools that are devotional, like McCann doing, doing really like a historic job in readying you know, that generation that you're referencing, but also guidance offices in schools. You know, is there really room for guidance to happen in terms of counseling and looking at a student's motivation and competencies and saying, hey, let's have a conversation. I mean, there's 411 students for the, in the United States. The average guidance counselor has 411 students. Now, we don't have to be masters at mathematics to figure out that in the number of days available for that guidance counselor, the number of minutes available to be with those students, to hold conversation, it, it just doesn't work. The math doesn't work. So I think we really need to rethink those structures too, um, as well as you know shifting that narrative around here by you know taking up your challenge. And so it's not one thing; it's multiple things, right? Just like the example shared by Eric, the, the we have to attack sort of inadequate structures within systems that are connected. There's this uh, area of systems thinking called uh, well talks about the interconnected uh, like interorganizational networks. And we have interorganizational networks for supply chains developing and building something, but we also have them for uh, building thinking and building getting work ready. I think that's where we can do some really cool work that's innovative, maybe socially, maybe from a career development standpoint, and that's very helpful. And then we can shake some of the stigma because there are meaningful conversations and all the work around, you know, what, what do modern workers want? They want meaningful work and they want self-expression. Well, I did too, you did Roger, you know, Linda, we all wanted that, right, Chris? It's just that they're more loud about it, right? So uh, how does somebody discern that? And our unemployment rate of folks in the 20s is also quite high, have you noted that? A lot of 20 year olds trying to figure out what they're going to do now. How about we just do something? It doesn't have to be perfected. Right, just do something, and what's the space for that person to then have a conversation for, with a counselor of some sort post high school? So I think there's a really a need for us to be, as parents, as guidance counselors, educators, and leaders, and influencers, an opportunity to, to be part of that change that you're asking us to be part of. You know, and I think one of our, one of our responsibilities through our platform here at the BIC is to, you know, use an event like this to begin to deconstruct this narrative. Again, the scar tissue is so deep. The narr narratives have been reinforced in families and communities uh, for generations. And, and in order to deconstruct a narrative that is so deeply embedded in the culture, it takes a lot of time. It takes intention. Um, and you know, there is, all we hear is workforce, workforce, workforce. I mean, you know, whether it's healthcare or manufacturing or hospitality, I mean, every, every industry right now is in a workforce crisis. Um, when it comes to manufacturers, you know, locally, here in the Berkshires in the state of Massachusetts, um, I think there's a, a, a very specific disconnect between the reality of what these jobs are in terms of the quality of these jobs, going to work for Boyd Biomedical, mm -hmm. and what people think of that job when they see it on a piece of paper. 
Helen, Ellen Boyd. Um, I'm not going to speak on okay. that, that, that part. But I think one thing I just want to say, um, which I think a theme is coming up, a, a takeaway that I did have, and PJ, maybe because of watching you create Project Frontline, um, I too was trying to think about the creators of this, what's the message they're wanting to um, send away. And one thing that I, just at the end there, actually, looking at the juxtaposition of the walking out of the um, American factory workers versus the Chinese factory workers, they were laughing, they were engaging, they were looking at each other, whereas the Chinese workforce is more head down, straightforward, and that's what they know. That's what they know. Whereas, you know, at the beginning of the film, there is a real touching moment where they're praying together as they are shutting down a factory that was their community. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something, everyone's just looking for belonging. Mm -hmm. And to, I wish they touched more on that in this film that it is about a community. And I, I really, I'm biased a little bit on this, but I think we have an amazing community here mm -hmm. that is wanting to mentor the youth. Mm -hmm. To your mm -hmm. point about vocational, um, yeah. just the rise in vocational needs yeah. and your point about helping these poor guidance counselors, yeah. um, I would love to see every high school student be given, we'd have to come up with a different term, but a coach when they arrive to high school. And to just somebody they can chat with and say, hey, today, I really like thought this was cool. And that could be math, or that could be at, you know, yeah. something else, something in art class, or this, mm -hmm. that, or the other. So kids are starting to be encouraged to talk about what they're feeling passionate about, and they have an adult asking them questions. And I, I do think we are really, really lucky here, because we have tons of businesses that are excited to open their doors and do internships I, here. I, so. I have to just give a quick, what I meant about the social contract was people don't realize how interconnected General Motors and Dayton were. There was a company, General Motors used to own a company called Delco. Delco actually stood for Dayton Electric Lighting Corporation. Most of GM's patents in the early part of the last century came out of Dayton, not Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was when Delco was getting ready to, when GM was getting ready to separate Delco and spin it off to Delphi, the brake plant went on strike and shut down all of General Motors. When they separated Delphi, the CEO of Delphi made it his personal mission to close down every factory in Dayton and move it, move it to Mexico. And so that's when the social contract started breaking. And then eventually the truck plant that you see here also closed down as well. And it just decimated this community. At the same time, their other stalwart was NCR Corporation, which also did something very similar. Well, you can't have that happen anymore. And we, I know it's happened here. I'm struggling with this term, social contract. Well, what does that mean? It means, in my opinion, because I use this all the time, when I grew up in Youngstown, the companies paid their employees a decent wage, a living wage. It was tough working conditions, but everyone did their shift. They got their eight hours. There was some animosity between the union and management, but generally the companies understood that if they pay their workers well, those workers put back into the community and ultimately buy the products that were being made, right? It's the whole Henry Ford concept. Pay my workers enough that they can afford to buy one of our cars. That started breaking down in the 90s for various reasons. That's when offshoring took place, and that's when everyone said uh, in... So, so a social contract is paying people more than necessarily the business needs to operate but enough that they can consume the product. That's what I use, and that's my term well, of social that, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I run a business that I'm paying people more than the business would, would justify them? General Motors and Ford and all these companies were making a profit back then, so they can pay people middle class wages. People bought product, and it did effective, and it wasn't all about shareholder return. It was about stakeholder return. And so but, it's, but, but so that's it's a, a social that's, contract. That's, You're going to pay that's your employees fictional. enough to live. There's probably. no such thing as stakeholder return. Shareholder return or people who invest money. You would there not. Is absolutely stakeholder return. Absolutely. I, I disagree with you. You would not invest your retirement funds in a company that prioritizes stakeholder return over shareholder return. Absolutely, I would. 
100%. You would. So you would lose money. Do it already. So you would lose money in your retirement account. No, because, because in the long run, in the long return. run, in the long run, that is going to be a higher paying stock because it invests in its stakeholders, not just its shareholders. So shareholder return, return is about the next quarter. Stakeholder return is about the long term of that company. No, no, no. State uh, shareholder return is long, long game too. I, I, I won't argue with the short game versus long game. I think you're right about that. But, but stakeholder return has come to come to um, uh, equate with. Um, people who don't have a financial investment in the business, but they should, they should, um, the, the business should manage for their outcome. At least that's my understanding. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm slightly disagreeing with it. So I would say that what's interesting about this conversation is that what I'm taking away from, from this exchange is that we want to be humanistic um, and socially driven as leaders. And if we can be humanistic, socially driven, it means that we're receptive to the plight of others, we're open to it. And we understand how to effectuate that through our leadership or influence of resources and people. And if we can do that, then we're balanced. So call it whatever you want and have whatever interpretive measure. And I say that with you know, a lot of love and kindness and acceptance. But ultimately, how do we create a system that's not overcompensating just because the money might end up in the ecosystem, that we actually are doing it because we understand the plight of people and we build systems accordingly. When I was the president of Alex Anani University and advising the CEO of Alex Anani, and the founder back in the day, we built a system called Charity uh, by Design inside the development of that company. It became a $1.2 billion company in about 40 months. And we were able to give tens of million of millions of dollars away because it was built into the business plan. Just like the BIC is working with the neighbor organizations like your organization, many of, of, of the organizations represented in this room today and online, that if we build into the plan, like collaboration, organization and creativity in a synergistic way, we can answer the call to invent new ways of answering the issues at hand, whether it's career discernment, whether it's how to involve people in an outcome as a stakeholder or shareholder that eventually loops back because the right effort was exerted, right? So I guess what I'm saying is, I love watching you argue. It's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like it like too. To um, and, and what's wrong with paying people a living wage? You know, no one's asking for overcompensation, but let's be honest with each other. Very few, many Americans do not make, work full time and do not make a living wage. That's why they have a second job. Uh, that's why they go deeper into debt. Um, and, you know, some of that responsibility comes back to the employer, you know, in, in, making, in making decisions that are, you know, that benefit the worker and not just the shareholders. Well, we, we all know the story of that credit card company out west who, you know, the CEO who just, I don't want to be an infomercial, but who decided to like level the playing field and everybody gets paid $75,000 a year, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, cool. Like if you're, if you're a company, you can just equalize pay and they believe that whatever the number is, 75, 83, 89, 110, that you're worth something regardless of what I, you know, that's another method, methodology. I think what it comes down to is that you're all highlighting that there are some ethics that we need to consider as we build and innovate and re-innovate and evolve uh, organizations, especially because we can here in the Berkshires. We can actually think about being more inclusionary and integrating each other's interests in a way that's, to your point, Roger, maybe more fair to all of the stakeholders and shareholders. Mm -hmm. That's Eric's point, not mine. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying they owe us something. I'm saying that they should get paid fairly. And the, and the, I think that's what yeah. read. The mentality that you saw in, in the American workers in this film, they mm. felt they were owed something. Mm. And from, yeah. from a different generation, a different era. A different, you, you know, you, well, that's why General Motors had, had very I, burdensome I, pensions, right, for I, a while. And, 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 and General Motors is creating higher value-added jobs, so people are earning living wages. Right, so they had to shift. So I think where we're getting at is adaptability. How do you adapt as a company so that you don't have to go to overcompensating someone because you want the money to stay in a community? But the concept of a living wage... Yes. doesn't necessarily come from the employer. It comes from the environment that the people have to live in. Well, it's right? a dynamic thing. Right. The right. employer can only pay the wage that the labor dictates for the product that they're so, making. So, you know, in the 1970s, General Motors decided to put the screws to Ford by signing the fattest UAW contract yeah. with, with their employees, knowing that Ford couldn't keep up. And eventually Ford almost went on a big, they went on a bank of bank bankruptcy, right? So... That's malicious use of human capital, in my personal opinion, because it eventually caught up to GM. 
paying your employees a living wage is something that I think is an absolute essential mandate of any company. Where GM went too far with this union contract is creating something like a job bank, for example, mm -hmm. where people are getting paid even when they're not working or getting the full wage. And that created all the inefficiencies that eventually led to GM's bankruptcy. There's a balance in there that I think we're trying to You can't pay more for an hour of labor that goes into a product if you can't sell it with a product no, understood. on the I'm, other no, end. No, I understand that. What, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is there has to be a balance that takes everybody in the company's stakeholder sphere, the employees, the customers, everything, and you balance it out so that employees can get paid a living wage. Mm -hmm. The other thing, too, and I've seen this with private equity firms that I used to have as clients, they're starting to realize that they were underpaying employees and they lose productivity. So what's happening is now private equity firms, which are considered the greediest on Wall Street, are starting to give their employees of their companies that they own uh, shares and options in the company. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's ways to incentivize people to reward them for the upsides of growing the company without overburdening the company. But uh, there has to be that balance. Uh, but do, do, what we're seeing here to unfold is the complexity of trying to balance shareholder interests and stakeholder interests and everyone's interests. And and that's something that we have to just pay more attention to as we build organizations. Yeah. That I mean, that's to me the bigger, that's the meta lesson. Right. Yeah. Linda Dooley. Yeah. Do you leave time? Uh, bring us to the finish <laughs> line. Where are you? Well, I'm going to um, give you like a five to seven minute warning because Celtics tipped off like one. seven minutes ago. So, it's going um, on the big screen as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as, as, soon as uh, My name is Linda Dooley. Um, I've been involved in manufacturing since I was an infant. I was raised in a family commercial printing business, uh, worked in it, um, went on and had a career with General Electric, Allied Signal, Duracell, and now I have a consultancy that specializes in the hum human side, the human communication and collaboration. That is the fundamental to make businesses run, I'll say in America, but I'll say anywhere too. So when I looked at this movie, there was absolutely no focus on human dynamic and communication collaboration. Mm. And I happened to be part of the GE, actually my first GE job was in Pittsfield and went on to three others, but where GE pioneered the whole, en it wasn't called engagement, uh, but it was now called engagement, but we're frontline, our frontline employees were challenged to help us improve every single process. So the voice of the frontline was never, ever illuminated in this. Yeah. Uh, and it was painful for me to watch it. It yeah. was also painful for me to see that people weren't in any collaborative experience. And mm -hmm. I think that was a very deliberate depiction mm -hmm. of, of the industry. Um, but the second point I also want to make is the beta program here, which I volunteer in and I'm yes. a coach, needs to become a blueprint in communities. And then the guidance counselors yeah, won't right have on. 441 students right. that right. are clamoring for 10 minutes of attention. And I'm passionate about that program. Mm. I do a lot of volunteering to help coach our next generation leaders. Mm -hmm. But that needs to become a blueprint that gets imported right on. to other communities. Yeah, right. Thank you for that. Thank you for the volunteerism and the effort, too. And. When I think of like the beta program, or I think of Varsity Tech, which is another stream of, of learning curriculum and development for the high schools that we're creating here, these are where we're, our job really at the BIC when it comes to younger folks <clears throat> having experiences is to become an advanced manufacturer of learning experiences so that they have like micro moments of exploration and they can really enjoy what it's like to reflect on something. But you got to do something. And in this world, we don't do a lot of things, so we have to you know, curate that thing that you do that, that you then think about, because you can't just think about it and not do it and have it actually have any muster, right? I mean, you can't live in, in that space of not doing something. So I appreciate your, you know, your unbelievable passion for the development of the younger generation. Thank you. And I want to tack on to that a very simple thought that programming is rec replicable. So you develop yeah. a blueprint through program like beta. It's why we find it, you know, when yeah. we do these social issue films, we, you know, we, it's, it's important to include stories about programming because if you're a social services organization on the west side of Chicago and you can learn how to solve for homelessness, solve for addiction, solve for mental health, that's applicable on the east side of Los Angeles. It's applicable, right applicable in Boston. It's applicable in, you know, right. exponentially. And so that's programming right. is replicable. I'd also really like to answer Roger's earlier question of why would you invest in a company for your retirement fund? And I think the answer is that you, you sure, wouldn't. Wait a second. Are you sure you want to do that with Roger? He's really excited. No, tonight. I do. <laughs> you wouldn't, and I would. And the reason for that is that the older we get, the shorter our horizon gets. Quarterly returns matter more to you than they do to me. What this region does in decades. <laughs> He's not beating around the bush, Roger. <laughs> there might be a slight difference. Um, but I think that 
you know, when we see uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to vote, the more likely you are to set the political trends in this country. You have less time left on the workforce, so your future gets more and more detached from the fruits of your labor. You're not like, I have a big 20-year career ambition to start a new company and do this new thing. You're like, okay, now I'm kind of coasting out. I have a certain lifestyle I'd like to maintain. And this isn't you specifically, but in general, the older you are, the more likely you are to think that way. The younger you are, you care about growth. You care about opportunity. You care about yeah. innovation. Yeah. And you care about what your region and your country are going to be doing decades from now. Yeah, I, I think so. You're, yeah, was, I think the, it, 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 it could be broken up pretty quickly. There was, there was, a, was there a question wanna, in the back? Was there? No. Yeah, maybe. No. Possibly. I, had, I, saw, a hand, I saw a hand yeah, up. I didn't yeah. know if you were it stretching. It was another in base. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Grab, grab the mic. I, my son went through a vocational path in Taconic, and um, I'm glad about that, but it's a very young age to make a decision like that. And mm -hmm. so I hope that the academic structure at Taconic um, supports the idea of even making different choices through high school of either continuing on a solely a vocational or a collegiate path and has an academic like stronghold to fortify the kids who want to do vocational and continue with college in an engineering sense and support them. And that wasn't in place really when he was there, but they were developing it. And I think now that they're going fully vocational, that will be an opportunity for kids. But him in, interning at, um, at, at Boyd Technology showed him the engineering vision while he was in co-op at Taconic. And he's pursuing that now. Um, and But his skills there, um, in the vocational advanced manufacturing ha have been incredibly um, door opening in college as well. So it's like, it's great to have a path in high school and have those opportunities, but don't just make that the end game either. That's right, um, right make on. it a tributary to many, many ways to go. Yeah, um, and, I think and, and keep looking forward. So, it, it, it's so encouraging to hear you say that because you know my wife and I have conversations about our 22 year old and 24 year old at, all the time, and there, there's a little bit of a perfectionistic sort of thing. Like right, I'm going to find the thing, the one thing that's the thing that's the thing that'll carry me through all things. And it's like, wait a minute, it sounds like a Dr. Seuss thing. But like you know, we really need to encourage them to you know not re not fail fast, but to reframe something that that might be a failure to them because it didn't hit an expectation into a lesson that was informing and <laughs> enriching and and that's our job as elders in the community right if we want to be wisdom at work as our con our contribution here we need to think about how we invite those conversations and not shove them off and say me be you know you should be more self-reliant you know I will also say that my daughter is who's 24 is also in manufacturing but came from a totally different avenue um, and brought on um, a new manufacturing, because uh, she was in um, supply chain for Procter & Gamble and sustainability and um, product innovation, or um, packaging innovation. Okay. And so she brought on a whole new manufacturing lab at 24 um, in West Virginia. Wow. And the interesting thing is that academia, even on a collegiate level, is really bending towards this film a little <laughs> in some places. and then. And the reality is that it, um, it, it's, it's interesting just to see some of the new things come on that are incredibly dynamic. And so it's like you can't forget what's coming. <laughs> you know, I want to say really quick uh, regarding the vocational school, and this is not baked into our plans yet, but we're working on it. Once we get operational, we plan on hiring from Taconic Vocational School, but we also plan on giving in, as incentives tuition reimbursement for BCC and potentially MCLA for kids who, you know, want to go down that path. And again, it goes back to stakeholder, right? You know, just creating an ecosystem where if these kids leave us after a couple of years and they go on for full year, you know, full time four year college, but we're able to, you know, replace them with, you know, kids in that same path, then we're doing our jobs, in my opinion. So well in what and what we're doing with the, the manufacturing academy is that we're we have already had conversations with local uh, learning um, 
groups, the schools, the universities and colleges, to do PLA, prior learning assessment, so that it's a credit documentation mapping. So if somebody goes through our program here, the uh, systems thinking for applied technologies, for the application technologies, that might come with 12 college credits. So imagine that somebody comes through and they, they grab 12 college credits. We do prior learning assessment for the program that you're, you're running, and we, we stamp that. Somebody shows up with 20 credits, you know, they're on their way, right? So they might actually stack. Yeah, 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 very much. Yeah, yeah. So from dual enrollment and beyond, right? Yeah, it's great. All right, thank Light, you, lightning you. round. We're going to start down the end with, oh. uh, with, with Mike, and we're going to get some closing thoughts from our panelists, and we're going to uh, uh, wrap up for the evening. But this is, a, this is fantastic, and just I, I really appreciate the back and forth. Um, you know, this, is, this truly is a dialogue, um, and everyone's opinions um, are welcome. Mike? So what are you looking for? Just clo 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 closing <laughs> thoughts. Talk about my, the virtue of vocational away? education. I mean, you know, for me, honestly, uh, I'm just looking at the feeder system. We talked about it. The trades have gotten very specialized. So I think if you go like we come through Taconic and the trades, I still think you're going to end up with an education, going to college and getting an education because everything is so specialized now that you need that education. So I'm just continuing. I'm, I'm hoping to become a bigger part of what's going on here to educate people. Thanks, Mike. My, my obscure takeaway, first off, thank you, everybody, and I apologize for talking way more than I should have, but my, my obscure takeaway is I'm a little disappointed in Barack and Michelle for supporting this particular movie, <laughs> yeah, especially because they did, President Obama did so much work to recreate the innovation economy and manufacturing. They should be doing a documentary about all the positives and not really kind of playing off on the negatives between this animosity between two different cultures clashing. So mm -hmm. thank you, everyone, for your time tonight. I really appreciate the BIC for inviting me to be a part of this today. I, Doctor, I, I just think that thanks, PJ. I just think that this kind of event, right, where you can grab the microphone literally and express how you feel and how you think and what you want, is a central role to the BIC, right? Where that's what we're here to do: have these positive returns on collisions with events and people. So, having said that, it's just great to see it in action again this month. And um, there'll be beer and coffee and water for others if you want to stick around. Tim. Uh, I think America does two things incredibly well. I think we manufacture high quality goods and I think we foment exploitative labor practices across industries. And I think that we really have a say in which one of those we lean towards more. I think we're trending in a better direction now, uh, but I think we have a lot of work left to do there. Mm. Yeah. All right, no closing sermon for me. I just want to, you know, this, so this is part of our Big Presents event series. This is third Thursday of every month. Um, the content differs from month to month, so occasionally it's a film. You know, last month it was a, a panel on recycled, materi recycled material innovations in the fashion industry. Um, so a really diverse, you know, range of content. Um, but, you know, one of our objectives through this event series is to get people in the building, get these conversations moving. Dr. D stole all my closing talking points, uh, which is fine. But, um, you know, I just want to thank you all for coming and, uh, you know, keep coming back and, and, you know, bring somebody with you next time is all we would ask.